So I'm going to give you a, a brief taste of some uh, things we're trying to put into motion here uh, out on the, on the Olympic Experimental State Forest. You may have seen some of our <clears throat> media coverage lately. We're, uh, it was the Peninsula Daily News, not the Seattle Times, but you know, we're, we're working our way. Um, <clears throat> So let me start <clears throat> to, to create a context for what we're trying to do, because I think it's really critical. Um, if we look at a timeline of what's been happening out here on the OESF area, everybody knows there was some very intensive harvesting that happened in the 70s and 80s, an old growth commission report that led to uh, new infrastructure, including the Olympic Experimental State Forest and the Olympic Natural Resources Center here, this very facility. Um, there have been a number of events that have occurred, <clears throat> including uh, the HCP, the development of the land management plan by DNR uh, that was released last uh, fall. And, but what, what we're doing here is trying to look forward. Where, where is this uh, group going to go? And one of the things we're doing beyond this experiment <clears throat> is to try to build a, a community across uh, the University of Washington and DNR and others, including all of you, uh, we would like to see as part of this uh, collective effort to, uh, in, in our sense, it, what, what I'm thinking is uh, to find ways to apply science to big picture questions that could help improve and change management <laughs> over time. Now, a lot of the, the, the science that you've heard about today you know, fits at a, at a lower level, but can contribute to this big picture question. Now, as a scientist, I, I, I like to see data. So, you know, we talked about lots of harvest. Well, this, I had to dig out the DNR harvest uh, in Jefferson County back through time. And it's pretty fascinating to see the level of harvests that were going on between 1965 and 1990, um, <clears throat> particularly compared to what's been going on since then. So it's important to have this, uh, to understand the, the, this huge difference. And, and it really leads to, I think, a really critical question is, you know, what about how do we do sustainable management? Now, a lot of people might think of this as uns unsustainable. <clears throat> and, but you could also think about, is this the right sustainable level, too? I think, all, I think all those questions should be on the table, and I'm not going to give you answers to that. But uh, I think we can say that the kinds of harvest levels that occurred here were not uh, conducive to an even flow of wood to support a wood industry in, out on the peninsula. I think that's fair. <clears throat> so we want to start this experiment by thinking <clears throat> about sustainability. And there's been a lot of changes in how people think about sustainability uh, since the uh, 1980s and 1990s. And they're really, you can now see the three very clear tenets of ecosystem sustainability. <coughs> Excuse me. First of all, people need to be considered as an integral part of the ecosystem uh, that requires a dual focus on both community well-being as well as ecological well-being. And together, you have what I would like to call ecosystem well-being. But you can't, you know, if we focus on one, Community well-being, perhaps reflected in the left-hand side of the previous graph, or if we focus too much on, on the ecological side, you're not going to achieve ecosystem well-being because both of those things, well-being of both the community and the forest, are really necessary in this view to, to be considered sustainable. And the goal, you know, so it's not community first, which you, I think could, be, just could describe what was happening on the Forest Service lands prior to the Dwyer decision. And it's not ecology first. 
sustainability that could be attributed to the post, you know, the Northwest Forest Plan kind of approach. So the goal here is to how do you achieve a high and sustainable level of ecosystem well-being? That's the kind of the question that, I, that drives this study. The second one, it should be a two, um, <clears throat> Second tenet is that all ecosystems, we know from the, from the ecological studies, have very unique characters. You can't, um, you can't apply knowledge generally down to the, to the local area very easily. So site, the concept of site specificity is essential. That's true for the community well-being too. It, each community <coughs> or group of communities within an ecosystem has unique characters. And so if you, if you accept this notion that we need site specificity, it leads you to this next point, which is one we will be focusing on, which is that people need to define sustainability for themselves. You can't impose sustainability upon them. And it's this unit of, that we need to start with if we're gonna build sustainability at, at larger scales. The third tenant is, and one that does not get anywhere near enough attention, is that we need a robust science-based learning effort to determine if we are actually sustainable. The vast majority of things people call sustainable do not have a learning component. What, what's shown below here is the adaptive management framework that was put together for the Northwest Forest Plan in, in 97. And it basically states that we need to define questions and we need to have a learning infrastructure that can answer those questions. And there are various approaches, learning methods to, to, to answer the questions, uh, <clears throat> including one called management experiments, which is where this experiment kind of fits into the, to this, this framework. This framework has been, was not, this was developed for the Forest Service or for the Northwest Forest Plan area. It's not been well applied. I mean, you can say, yes, we've been doing um, some outcome trend analysis and traditional research, but, but as a whole, that's not been achieved. We have an opportunity here in the OESF to actually do this because DNR has a very serious commitment to adaptive management, <clears throat> perhaps more serious than anybody else. <coughs> so just to, to uh, <coughs> sum up, you have a three-legged stool. We need all three pieces to make this work. And it's, it's, it's also about the height of the stool. Don't forget that. So this is the ecosystem which we're focused on which happens to be the OESF boundary, but it includes, it includes communities as well as this, the forests that we've been talking about. So we're gonna need to do more outreach to really talk to people about what sustainability uh, means to them and you know, whether or not we can combine um, this idea of, of maintaining community as well as ecological well-being. <clears throat> This is just to kind of paint the picture of how this study was uh, conceived. So the key questions, again, are can we achieve both ecological and community well-being? And are there different strategies that will achieve that objective? Really simple. So the, the concept of the experiment that I'm going to describe is to develop and experimentally compare a range of approaches at an operational scale. So this is not really traditional research at all. This is the management people applying different strategies at the scale they normally apply management, but creating these different approaches that can then be compared. And it ideally, it will contribute to future estimates of sustainable harvest levels 
Um, <clears throat> and other, you know, the big, the big picture problems, not just the, the scientific details. So here is, this is a, a map of the DNR trust lands in the, in the uh, Jefferson County area of the peninsula where we focused. We searched through these type three watersheds that you've been hearing about to find a potential experimental units. Um, we've been searching through these for some time now and we're, we're starting to make progress on narrowing it down. But let me just show you what these look like from an aerial photo. Uh, here's Manor Creek, um, and you can see <clears throat> they're fairly large watersheds. Here's the, the mouth of both of them as they come together. They're, so it gives you the sense of the size and the water flow that's coming out of these. Here's a map showing the, um, it relates to the management of these, this landscape. So here with the hatches are the older forests that remain in the area. Uh, mostly, we think, linked back mostly to the 21 below. Um, it also has areas, this, these yellow areas, which are modeled as potentially unstable. <clears throat> which has important you know, implications for what kinds of activities can occur there. And you're also seeing in the red just some, some um, potential location of future units that could go forward in the next 10 years, just as a product of a modeling effort. So here's the, <clears throat> the treatments that this group, and I, and I want to say, I, I forgot to mention, this, this has been a, a, a group effort that began about a year and a half ago. It's involved a lot of people. Um, Tom DeLuca, the, the former uh, director at, at CEFS, was uh, a key player. Angus Brody has been a key player. We've been working um, with the Olympic region folks, and uh, Bill Wells is in the back there. Uh, and others, um, <clears throat> and this is what we've come up with. A comparison of four, four treatments, we would call them experimental treatments. The first is a no action control. So here we would go and we would avoid you know, any sort of management activity, but only for a decade because it, this is really inconsistent with DNR's mandate. But they, they have given us the opportunity to have at least a decade without any, any activities in, in a subset of these watersheds. <clears throat> the second one is the OASF land plan itself. So what, what DNR is planning to do across the OASF would occur in these, water in these selected watersheds. The third one, which is a, a zoned management approach, um, is different from the, the, the OESF land plan is, they call it integrated management, but r what it really is, is a non-fixed boundary um, allowing management to, and, and, and succession to develop and move around the landscape over the long term. And this was a, a, a key idea that was debated in the Northwest Forest Plan and rejected um, and they, they chose using zoned management, which is to have permanent fixed reserves. So the question of whether fixed reserves or f a floating, uh, shifting mosaic approach is a key, is a really important question. And this, this study can help to address that. It also, I mean, the way this is, is probably not going to reflect Forest Service management as much as it will the DNR management that occurs outside the OASF, which is also a fixed reserve approach. The last, and I think potentially most in interesting, is this accelerated integration idea, where again, there would be no fixed, or very few fixed reserves on the landscape, and we would open it up to, you know, maybe taking some higher risks in the hope of getting higher returns um, 
This could include some activity inside some of those older stands that you know, wouldn't necessarily, I mean, could be seen as improving them ecologically, but it could also generate some revenue. Uh, it could in, include a, not, a number of things, and I've got a, uh, just a long list here <clears throat> of ones that are on the table. Uh, the idea, we're going to attack this in the development of the study plan. So, but these are just some, some of the ideas that had been thrown out to kind of modify, expand the civil cultural toolbox, if you will, um, which could include things like alder rotations in riparian areas with the idea that perhaps, Kyle, where are you? We can increase the food supply to, to salmon with, by having more hardwood shrubs and trees, where, which will have more insects and birds and so forth that may potentially um, get those little fish to be a little bit plumper. <clears throat> but it could also, you know, we're talking about different kinds of thinning that have been, not been done before here, go to some wider spacings, more like they've done on the Sayus Law, for example. Um, the other thing is we're not, you know, it's not just silviculture. We're talking about the, the entire system. So road maintenance uh, is a major determinant of, of the management that, that occurs out there because it's so expensive. So we're going to open up the question of can we do something different with road maintenance, perhaps to generate more revenue, uh, perhaps to change the uh, environmental effects of of uh, the maintenance activities, you know, and the same is true with logging systems. And we're, we're not on the table as well as, are things like recreation of different kinds, tourism, uh, even hunting, you know, elk. You know, if people in, the, in these local communities are very, fo if there's a large percentage that are focused in on, on deer and elk for either hunting or wildlife observing, whatever. There could be some changes to management that would focus in on uh, altering those ungulate populations th through management. So that, that could be on the table as well. <clears throat> so what I'm showing you here, which is on this map on the wall here, is our current tentative uh, selection of watersheds, we have one more hurdle to go through to, to make this final. But uh, the idea is we found groupings of watersheds that we, through a process, deemed to be more similar, and we put those into blocks. So we have five blocks, uh, and you can come and look at this, the map if you want afterwards. The next step, once these are settled upon, will be to randomly assign those treatments that we just saw earlier to each one of those experimental units. So I'm going to end with just showing you the, the kind of timeline for the study that and where we are right now is we've, we're in coming to the end of the watershed selection phase. Next month, we're going to start the study plan development effort uh, with a uh, workshop on campus May 17th, um, which will be reviewed uh, as other study plans are. And once finalized, we will begin pretreatment monitoring sometime this summer, which will involve a lot of the watershed type monitoring that you've seen here already. And the idea is to have the first set of treatments go, actually go on the ground in 2019. Now this is, this is our study focus. Of course, that arrow to the right uh, represents a monumental amount of work by the Olympic region. Uh, and, a, and actually a whole lot more work than what we're looking at here. But also we're, we're exploring the idea of, with the university, of doing a, a a swap, a land swap, so the experiment becomes UW Trust Lands. And the idea is we think we can talk the university into moving some of the revenues that, have been, that are generated in putting the study in into an endowment that will fund 
the research monitoring and education to carry this study into the future. So that I'll, I'll stop with that. I think it's a, you know, an ambitious and uh, <clears throat> somewhat unprecedented opportunity to, to apply science to these big questions that directly can link into management decisions. <clears throat>